going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to be tonight in our text. And uh, if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,126, and you will find Romans chapter 12, our text for the night. And if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you need one, then please take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Uh, hey, we're talking about expectations tonight. And I was thinking about this, you know, unmet expectations and unrealistic expectations and how frustrating they are for our lives. And I also realized that it's the opening weekend of NFL football. Which just fits perfectly for unrealistic expectations because I am a Cardinals fan. And, and honestly, if you're a fan of almost any team, uh, you, your expectations are not met. But right now, this is a great day because th this is the day when everybody has expectations and uh, most of them are unrealistic. Most of them will be unmet uh, as the, the year unfolds, but we don't really care because we're fans anyway. But unmet expectations and unrealistic expectations frustrate our lives. They damage our marriages. They haunt our families. And a lot of times, we don't communicate expectations. We don't tell people what we're thinking uh, that we're expecting of them. And then we get angry when they don't meet our unspoken expectations. Right? This is, this is, am I the only person this happens to? Yeah, I don't think so. See, I know this. Uh, and I know it's totally unfair, but it's real. It's what happens in our lives. I know this because uh, I created unrealistic expectations in my relationship with my wife, Merelda, uh, from the very beginning. In fact, we had just started dating. It was, it was right around that beginning of the relationship time, and I wanted to win her over. And so I left a rose and bad poetry on her doorstep three nights in a week, <laughs> anonymously. You know, secret admirer kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and in doing that, I, I did two things. Number one, I, I won her over. And I used up all of my romantic magic dust <laughs> for my entire life in those moments. And I created an expectation that she was somehow involved in a relationship with somebody who is innately romantic. And nothing could be farther from the truth. And I set a bar so high that I have never cleared it again. That's right, 38 years of blissfully happy disappointment uh, on her part. So, uh, you know, uh, it was a, and, and here's the thing, it was a point of contention in our relationship for a while until we began to talk about it, communicate it, and, 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 ex and share how we felt and, and the reality. So, so today we're talking about expectations, but we're not going to talk about unmet or, or unspoken expectations. We're going to talk about God's expectations of his followers. So if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. You believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and that he was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life then I get to share with you the expectations that God has for you as his child. Now, if, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, or you're just here checking uh, things out, then I want you to be informed about the expectations that God has for his followers. Now, some of you as followers, uh, you're going to hear stuff you didn't know when you made this commitment to Jesus. And I think this is going to help you tremendously. I think you're going to uh, at least understand what the expectations are and maybe be able to go, hey, I can step into that. I can do that. Uh, that's what I need to point towards. Uh, but uh, either way, I want us all to understand a whole lot better. Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul uh, writing. I'm just going to look at the first two verses uh, today. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect." 
don't know if you heard that or not, but God's expectations for his followers are for us to be a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Did you catch that? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, that may sound a little strange to you. If you're new to church, that really may not mean a whole lot to you because we don't live in a culture that practices religious sacrifice of animals uh, much. Uh, you know, that we, don't, we don't see that a lot. That's not kind of our everyday picture. So we hear the word sacrifice and we don't have the same imagery. So let's talk about the picture of sacrifice. Uh, the ancient world of worship, uh, of almost all the religions that were taking place, involved the slaughter of animals, sometimes people, but most of them didn't do that, but it involved the slaughter of animals on a grand and disgusting scale. Okay? You would bring your offering to the temple. When we talk about an offering, uh, you know, yes, they would take money, uh, and, and uh, grain and things like that. But most of the time, it involved an animal sacrifice. If you were poor, you might bring birds. Uh, but usually, they involved some kind of sacrifice. It was going to be a lamb or a goat uh, or uh, a cow. Okay, we're talking about big things. And, and they would take, the priest would take the animal to the altar, and they would usually slit its throat. They'd bleed it out. It would die. And, and then they would either burn the entire animal as an offering to God or to the gods, or they would uh, butcher it and, you know, burn up all the stuff you don't want to eat and sell the, the meat for money to fund the, the work of the, the temple. So Paul's listeners were familiar with sacrifice. They understood sacrifice, but the whole concept of a living sacrifice was weird and different for them, just as weird as uh, the idea of a sacrifice would be for us. So how can a sacrifice, something that you're offering up on an altar to God that is usually burned completely up, how can it be alive? How can we be a living sacrifice? That simply means that we offer our whole self to God. Our whole person, our whole self is offered to God. You see, the, the sacrifice was entirely given to God. It, the, the, the person who brought it, it gave it to the priest, offered it up. It was, it was sacrificed, and that person had nothing more to do with it. They had no more control over it. It was completely given to God. And so what that means is that God expects us to give our whole selves to him. Our whole selves. That means everything we are. So God expects us to give him our physical strength. Our abilities, our time, our energy, our talents, our mental capacities, our mental thoughts. God expects us to give him our creativity, our education, our love. God expects our devotion, our affection. He expects us to give him our relationships, our families, our influence, our dreams and our goals. He wants it all. He wants all of it. Our whole self given to God, not as something to die in his honor, but as people to live for his honor. That's what a living sacrifice is. It means that every moment of every day, every relationship we have, every task, job, or career that we're engaged in, every dollar that we make, every path that we take is dedicated to Jesus Christ. That's God's expectation of his followers to him. Now, let me be really clear. That's his expectation of his followers. That's not how we get salvation. Salvation's already been given to us as a gift. We've already received that eternal life. We've already been forgiven of our sins. We're not giving ourselves to God as a sacrifice so that he will give us eternal life. But instead, because we have received eternal life, because we've been forgiven of our sins, because we've been adopted into his family, he says, hey, you're my kids, you're my followers. Now I want you to offer yourselves up as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to me. I want you to do this out of love. I want you to do this out of gratitude. I want you to do this because you love me. So God expects us to give our whole selves to him. And realistically, this is worship. This is worship. Uh, did, you, did you notice what it says? So, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Other translations use the words reasonable worship or true worship. 
Now, I don't know what you think of when we talk about worship, but a lot of people think of worship as singing and praising God and listening to a sermon and giving an offering, saying some prayers. And, and all that is included in worship. But Paul explains that our true spiritual worship is living every single day for Jesus. That's what our worship is. It's living every day for Jesus. It's giving God our time, talents, energy, resources, and relationships. In other words, I want you to, I want you to get this picture because this is kind of a radical departure. It is an act of worship for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, when you are a godly husband to your wife, you are worshiping Jesus. Ladies, when, when you love your husbands and respect your husbands in the same way that you respect Christ, then, then you are performing an act of worship to God. Parents and grandparents, when you love your children and your grandchildren with the love of Christ and, and you're sharing that love with them and encouraging them to follow Jesus, you, you are worshiping Christ. When you, it's an act of worship when you go to work and you have a great attitude and you work with a great work ethic. That is an act of worship toward God. And don't sit here and think, oh, my job's too insignificant. It's not like working for the church or something. No, it doesn't matter what your job is. It's not insignificant. If you are doing it to honor Christ, it is an act of worship. It's an act of worship to live as part of a community that cares and serves and points others to Jesus. In other words, if worship for you is just an hour a week, then you are presenting yourself as a temporary sacrifice. Not a living sacrifice. God expects his followers to be living sacrifices. Now, is that an expectation that God has made pretty clear tonight? Is that something that you're hearing? Is that something that you understand? Because, again, I know how frustrating it can be when we have those unspoken expectations. And God wrote it down in black and white so you can read it, so you can go home and ponder it, so you can think about it. But, but that's the expectation that our Heavenly Father has for us as we follow Him in this endeavor to be Jesus' people. So God expects His followers to be living sacrifices, and God expects His followers to be transformed. To be transformed. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, the world desires that we think, look, and act like them. That's what the world wants. Now, we all know it's more comfortable to be around people who agree with us, right? I mean, it, it, you know, if who share your values, who share your language, who share your parenting style, your politics, or your religion. It, it's just those points of commonality draw us together, right? So if you're somebody who, who you know, whose language uh, it doesn't involve a lot of cussing, and you're around somebody who cusses all the time, that's a little bit awkward, isn't it? It's, it's true the other way around, too. If you're somebody that cusses all the time and you hang out with somebody who doesn't, it really gets, gets kind of awkward. You're apologizing all the time. I know, because it happens to me. And people are always like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, you know, it's just how it is. Or how about parenting? You know, maybe you're a disciplinarian parent, and you're hang, hanging out with friends, and they're like, they don't do any discipline with their kids, and their kids are running wild. How comfortable is that in that moment? Because inside you're like screaming, do something with your kids. Right? And your kids are sitting there going, can we be hellions too? And you're like, no. <laughs> On the flip side, maybe you're a free-range parent. And you like your kids just uh, to be free, and, and they're well-behaved, but they're, they're free. And you're hanging out with somebody who's ultra-disciplined, ultra-rigid, and they do this and that. And you're, and you're like, yeah, I'm sorry. I want you to be able to do that, but you can't. And it's, it's, it's awkward. See, we're kind of drawn to those people who, who, you know, we share values with. It's a point of commonality. I'm not even going to talk about politics because that's just too divisive. Uh, but uh, my guess is that some of your best friends probably don't have opposite uh, political viewpoints than you. See, we form groups around common values. 
the world. And, and when I talk about the world, when Scripture talks about the world, uh, what we mean is the non-Jesus-following culture that we live in. That's the world. The non-Jesus-following culture that, that we're exposed to. So the world doesn't value biblical truth. The world doesn't value biblical morals. It doesn't value biblical priorities. So have you ever been someplace and, and acknowledged or, or, you know, that you were a Christian and, and somebody kind of came up to you or just asked you flat out, do you really believe that? Anyone have that question? Yeah. See, a lot of you have. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's somebody who's just in awe that you would hold to biblical morals, that you would practice biblical generosity and tithing. And they're like, you really give that? You're mon- to the church? No way. You don't do- what are you, nuts? You know, that, that, that you hold to biblical priorities, and they're like, God, I don't get it. I don't understand it. And they, and they question our sanity. They really do. You see, the world really thinks Jesus' followers are crazy. And they want us to compromise, and they want us to conform. And unless we're intentional, we will conform. Unless we're defying that on purpose, we will conform to the world's values. We will conform to the world's priorities. We will conform to the world's morals. It's inevitable because we get drawn into that. But God will transform your life by changing your mind. That's what he wants to do. He wants to transform your life by changing your mind. That's what he said. Don't be conformed to to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. See, at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. That's actually one of the things we believe here, that this book is God's word, and it tells us what to believe and how to live, and that's why we give them away, and that's why we encourage you to read them, and that's why we encourage you to memorize them, that's why we encourage you to study them, because we know that if, if you'll put this book into your life, God will change your life. You see, the moment you confess Jesus as Lord, God the Holy Spirit inhabited your life. He's in you. He's with you always. There's nothing that can separate you from him. And he is the teacher. And so when you read the Bible, you know what you do? You give the Holy Spirit voice in your life. You're you're reading God's word and it allows the Holy Spirit to take the word of God and to penetrate your life and to tell you how to live differently. To communicate the truth about God to you that will alter your life. Have you ever been reading the Bible and and something just jumped out and smacked you? You know what that is? That's God speaking to you actively from his word. The Holy Spirit taking the word of God and applying it to your life. And you are listening to him. That's giving him voice. When you read it, that's what happens. When you memorize scripture, then you give the Holy Spirit a, a voice in your life all the time. See, if you only read it, then he can only really speak to you while you're reading it. But when you put it in your heart, when you put it in your head, when you memorize it and know it, then um, he can use it against you anytime he wants. And see, if we want to to live as this act of worship, as living sacrifices, then our minds have to be renewed. They have to be transformed. And the only way that happens is the Word of God getting into our lives. So God wants to transform your life by changing your mind. And because when he does that, well, you will know the truth or you will live a lie. See, the reality is we want to be transformed by the word of God because you're going to know the truth or you're going to live a lie. Uh, Satan was called by Jesus the father of lies. Okay, we just sang a song about this is how we fight our battles. Do you understand how the enemy fights his battles? Satan has two primary weapons that he uses against us. He's going to use against you. Those two primary weapons are lies and fear. Lies and fear. You can't overcome the lies of Satan unless you know what? The truth of God. The truth of God. That's the only way you're going to know it. That, and the only way we can live the truth is to know the truth. Otherwise, you're going to live a lie. And there's all kinds of lies out there that Satan is feeding us nonstop. Like, 
Here's one that all of us have believed at some point in our life that more money will make us happy or solve our problems. At some point, we've all bought into that. Or maybe you've thought an affair will bring you joy. Or maybe just spending some more time in front of the computer watching porn will satisfy you. Or maybe you bought into the lie that revenge is sweet. Okay, I don't want to use the word revenge. I just want to see him pay. Maybe you bought into the lie that fame is going to satisfy you. You want more than 15 minutes. You want to be known for something. Or maybe you just bought into the lie that your life is your business. Your life is your achievements. Your life really is about your success. See, and many of us are living out one or more lies that are actively destroying our lives, that are harming our homes, that are hurting our children, that are breaking God's heart. We have to know the truth or we're going to live a lie. And that's why God wants to transform your life by changing your mind. And then... If we know God's truth, if we let him change our mind through his truth, then God's wisdom prevents foolishness. God's wisdom prevents foolishness. I mean, if you want to live a wise life, just inhale this. Okay, just, just let this sink into your soul. I mean, there's an entire book in the Bible called Proverbs that is basically how not to be an idiot. Okay? I, I mean, I, I love Proverbs. I read it all the time because I don't want to be an idiot. Uh, because I hate being stupid. Anybody else hate being stupid? Yeah, but I do it so well. <laughs> and so often. And in those moments, I go, oh, man, why was I so stupid? I hate that. Now, the, the truth is, I, I may be stupid uh, often, but uh, most of them are little stupids. And I repent quickly, and there's not a lot of damage. See, what happens is when God renews your mind and, and you inhale his, his truth into your life, into your soul, then you begin to see those early warning signs of stupidity. Right? I mean, a lot of you go to the doctor and you get checked out because you want to see the early warning signs for heart disease. You want to see the early warning signs for cancer. You want to see those early warning signs so you can do something about it before it gets bad. That's what God's Word does for us. He puts wisdom in our life so we can see, have those early warning signs so we go, oh, wait a minute, if I keep going down that road, that's going to destroy my life, it's going to destroy my marriage, it's going to destroy my family. I don't want to do that. Because if not, then you reap what you sow. And um, most of us really don't want to reap what we sow. And then finally, when we renew our minds, we let God change our minds, then we understand God's will. We understand God's will. Did you hear how they described God's will? What is good, acceptable, and perfect. And see, when you're transformed by the renewal of your mind, you can test what God's will is and discern what is the will of God. Most of us want to know the will of God. Most of us want to do the will of God. But I don't know about you, but those are words, good, acceptable, and perfect, that I would like to describe my life. I would like good and acceptable and perfect to describe my family, to describe my my character, to describe the the way I conduct myself in the community. And, And the reality is the better you know God's word, the clearer God's will becomes. And then that good and acceptable and perfect becomes clear. And you go, hey, I know that. And now it it boils down to a choice of, am I going to do that? It comes back down to that point of obedience. Am I going to be a living sacrifice? Am I going to invite God to change my mind? So now the challenge. What are you going to do with the message? You know God's expectations. That he expects all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ to be living sacrifices, to let him renew our minds, change our minds through God's word. Some of you are like, I've heard that before. Okay. Some of you haven't heard it before. Okay. So what are you going to do with the message? 
Because change occurs in our life when we alter our routine and our habits. In other words, when we do something different. So we want, we want our lives to change. We go, okay, yes, God, I want to be a living sacrifice. Then what are you going to do differently to make that a reality in your life? I want to, I want to give you two specific, real practical challenges because, you know, sometimes that's kind of nebulous, all right? I want to be a living sacrifice. You walk out the doors, you go to dinner, and you go, I don't know what that means. I don't know how I'm going to do that. And then we just kind of go back to our old patterns and our old habits. So, so I'm going to give you two challenges. And, and uh, one is for some, one is for everyone. The, the first challenge is simply this. If you're not already in one, join a life group. Join a life group. We have life group signups that are happening outside right after the service. You can walk out there and you can join a life group. And some of you have thought about being in a life group. And some of you said, yeah, I'm just too busy. I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to somebody's house. I, I need child care. I need, you know, you've got all of these kind of excuses why you're not in a life group. But the reality is that's just all there is excuses. They're just excuses. And I want to challenge you that if you really want to be a living sacrifice, you really want to give yourself wholly to God, then give him your time, give him your energy, give him your priority, and make it a commitment to not just go out there and sign up and join a life group, but actually show up for it. Do the homework and invite God to alter your life because now you're in accountable relationships with other men and women who love God and who want to be living sacrifices along with you and see if that doesn't alter the trajectory of your life. It's changed my life. I'm in a life group, and I love it. So that's challenge. Now, some of you are in life groups, and you're like, yeah, that's right, join a life group. And some of you are in life groups, and you go, yeah, I don't go. You sign up really well. You just don't show up really well. I want to encourage you to rethink that. That's challenge number one. Let God alter your life by altering your habit by getting into a life group. Second challenge. This is for everybody. I want to challenge you to do 50 days of Bible reading. 50 days of Bible reading. In fact, I made it really easy. Uh, In your bulletin, there is a little card with 50 days of Bible reading on it. One chapter of the Bible a day. I know a lot of times you challenge people and they go, I don't know where to to read, and you start in Genesis, which is a great place to start, but at the same time, um, you know, it's a lot of history. And so what we did is we went through and we picked out 50 of our favorite chapters in the Bible. This is the best stuff. It's not all the good stuff, but it's, you know, some of our best stuff, some of the favorite stuff, some of the things that, places where God has spoken to me and others of our leaders. And and I'm just going to encourage you, take that, and, uh, and commit to 50 days of letting God speak into your life. Let him be the voice into your life. Give the Holy Spirit, you know, a voice and amplify it. 50 days. I'll take you through almost the end of October if you start on Monday. And then maybe if you're really wanting God to do something, you'll talk about what you're reading and what you're learning in your life group. Or you're with your spouse or with your family. I mean, parents, you got kids that are school age at home, maybe, you know, read it together. And, and this, this is an opportunity for you to invite God to change your mind by listening to his word in a simple, practical way. And by the way, those cards are they're just the perfect size to fit in your Bible so you can keep track of where you're supposed to be. Or the perfect size for you to put on your refrigerator or your mirror to remind you, oh yeah, I got to read. It'll take you between five and ten minutes a day to do this. Will you be that living sacrifice and give God that kind of priority? Because God's expectation for us is to be living sacrifices. But whether we do it or not is our decision. Let's pray.